Elizabeth. Welcome back to tonight's First Coast Forum as we look at the issue of human trafficking in Florida and around the world. I'm Melissa Ross. Lots of calls, emails, and tweets coming into the show, but keep them coming. Tweet us at WJCTJAX. Give us a call at 358-6347 or email us with your thoughts at firstcoastforum at WJCT.org. Back with us now for the second half hour, Dr. Lawanda Ravora, President and CEO of the Dolores Bar Weaver Policy Center. Now new to the panel, Erica Curran. She's Interim Director of Legal Clinics with Florida Coastal School of Law. Good evening. Lieutenant Scott Dingy with the local Human Trafficking Coalition with us once again. And Thank David you. Abramowitz, Regional Director with DCF. Good evening to you. Great to see you again, Melissa. Thanks for being here, all of you. And here is uh, an email from Dobby in St. Augustine. L Dr. Rivora, you talked about the Safe Harbor Act. Dobby wants to know, would it be possible for Florida citizens to fund Safe Harbor? That, of course, is the legislation you mentioned at the top of the hour helping child victims who've been trafficked? It, certainly, there would be an opportunity for private philanthropy around <clears throat> building safe houses or certainly underwriting some of the training that's really necessary for our staff who are working with this very vulnerable population. But Safe Harbor is more than that. It really is a law that says you can't lock up victims, that victims have to be have access to treatment and so there's two, two parts of that. Mm -hmm. It's the making sure that we are philosophically treating victims as victims and not treating victims as crim criminals and placing them in lockup facilities. Mm -hmm. And the other part of that would be funding safe houses. Because I think it is important for people to know in the state of Florida right now, we don't have a safe house. And in North Florida, even when the money was allocated last year, none of that money came to North Florida, mm. although we're the third highest in the state mm. of victims of trafficking. So there could, certainly could be a, a private funding, but I think it, it has to be a public-private partnership for long-term success. David Abramowitz, Regional Director with uh, our regional DCF office. Uh, you deal with these issues every day. What are your thoughts as you listen to this discussion about how we can do a better job of uh, protecting our children from traffickers? Now, this is, this is a great topic, and Melissa, thank you very much, and the esteemed panel that you have. We, I talk to all of them all the time. Uh, this is a very important topic. And, the safe harbor law is probably a significant law that got passed. And Scott and I deal with this topic all the time, and Lawanda and I deal with this all the time. Um, the law that changed is what Lawanda says, victim vice criminals, couldn't, it couldn't be more important because what happens is when, it, when, a, when a child is reported to Scott and or the hotline gets reported, as soon as it's reported, it used to be it would be chosen as a criminal, now they're victims. So now when it comes and Scott gets a shot, we get called. And then when we get called, we determine as a, as a human trafficker victim and we treat him just like a victim. Then we get the resources that comes on board. We come in and we try to get services. And you're right, is there a safe <coughs> house? The answer is no. But we do in this community, we have two homes. We've, we've actually gotten two homes that we get with a single mother that, get, that gets in there. We've trained them on, uh, on them, and we've gotten services with them. Almost, I hate to say it, I'm a soldier, almost we treat the uh, victim like PTSD, and we get services with them, and it takes not days, years to be able to get them. And if we go further, I'll explain with the children that I have met that have gone through them. But it is very good. Funding is needed, as Lawanda has said. And uh, it is very, very good that we've gone through this law for the last year, year and a half, that I think is better, but we're not there yet. Erica Curran, uh, th these cases can be complex legally. Can you talk about the legality surrounding this? Well, the work that we do in our clinic is often with the foreign national victims, many of who also fear um, being viewed as, as unlawful immigrants or illegals, and they're afraid to come forward and seek help because of the fear of deportation. Often the traffickers will threaten their family in the home country, threaten their children. Um, and so for them, there are special legal protections that allow them, if they cooperate with law enforcement, if they come forward and help, that they might be able to safely remain in the United States.
United States and be reunified with their family members. What are those special protections? So there's a visa called the trafficking visa, a T visa, which is for victims who come forward, assist law enforcement in the investigation or prosecution of a, of a crime. And if they do that, then they're offered the ability to remain in the United States for a period of time and often mm -hmm. bring any family members to join them if they're also at risk. Lieutenant Dingy, is that, how often do you see that, that uh, especially foreign nationals are terrified? They've been exploited over and over, and they're afraid that if they finally seek help, they'll, they'll be penalized again. And, uh, and, that, and that's extremely, extremely common for us. Uh, well, that's one of, you know, traffickers target vulnerable people. Well, who's more vulnerable than somebody who's afraid to even call the police? So if you don't have law enforcement backing you up, who is going to back you up? And, and that's what they feel. So we've done a lot with the sheriff's office, with our uh, international affairs unit, and through other outreach programs to try to address the non-English speaking community, the non-resident uh, community necessarily, and, and engage them and, and let them know that we're here for them just as much as we're here for any other citizen, that we will, we will protect them like anybody else. We're, we're not against them and we're not here to check their immigrant status and deport them and punish them further. We do want them to understand that they're victims and we're here to support them and, and to uh, help them move forward. And if you're just joining us, we want your calls, emails, and tweets tonight on the issue of human trafficking. It's our First Coast Forum simulcasting on radio and television. We want your emails at firstcoastforum at wjct.org, tweets to at wjctjax, and you can call us 358-6347 with your questions and comments. So, Lawanda Ravora, uh, so much of this is uh, clearing up misconceptions, raising awareness. Uh, it seems, though, that I would think in your work, you have to fight against some very deep, uh, deeply held ideas, especially when it comes to... Uh, the sexual exploitation of young women and girls, they're embedded in the culture and they're difficult to, it's difficult to change mindsets, I it's, would think. It's very difficult, but we also believe it's doable. And part of that is helping people to really understand the life histories, the lived experiences of the young women that we're working with and that we're advocating for. And for people to understand that trauma drives behavior because often, we have individuals who have perceptions of she's choosing to do that or it's blaming the girls, it's really blaming the victims and removing it from the trauma, the lived experiences that's really driving those behaviors. And so as a society, part of what we do is begin to try to have the discussion around what child would choose to live in this violent situation and that's mm -hmm. another issue that's really not talked about around sex trafficking it is violent and many of the girls that we have seen and that i have worked with over the years have had almost every bone in their bodies broken they have you know they long term health consequences from the violence and that's part of the brainwashing that happens the physical abuse but also the psychological abuse that says no one is going to believe you look at what you've done and unfortunately that gets reinforced sometimes in the very policies and practices of the institutions that should be there to be providing services so that's why training is so critical of our staff so that we really are not re-victimizing and re-traumatizing because what that does is reinforce what the pimp told her was correct. And so that puts her on a path of I have nowhere else to go but to go back. Mm -hmm. David Abramowitz, too. So often we're talking about really young people, minors, uh, kids, young, young kids, 11, 12, 13 years old. Can I tell you a story, Melissa, if you don't mind? And Lawanda hit it to me. This is personal for me. When I became the regional director two years ago uh, as the DCF director, I asked, uh, how many Cuban traffickers do I have of the uh, 5,000 kids that I have that are associated with me as Northeast Director? And they, they said, they gave me the number. And I said, uh, any one of my kids that's a human trafficker, I want to know as soon as they run away, I want to know right then and there. And within about a month, my first human trafficker ran away. She was 13 years old. She was in Duval. I said, as soon as she comes back, I want to know exactly when she comes back. She was a 13-year-old girl. 
as soon as she came back, uh, uh, I met her, and she went. Uh, she was in a group home. I didn't want her to go in a group home. I wanted to go to a foster home. And I, went, I met her in the foster, uh, foster home she went to. And I met her, and I said, tomorrow, because it was late Sunday night, I go, I'm going to meet you, and I want to I want to take you out to dinner with your foster mother. And I went with her, and I said, please don't run away. I'm going to take you out to dinner. We went to a Japanese steakhouse. And I met her for about three or four years, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And I met her, and she's talking to me, and she, she had explained to me she had sex with five men the night before. And she was explaining to me. She didn't understand what sex was, uh, and, and she, would, she had... Uh, human trafficking and I and I was I was just trying to have two girls my own I, I didn't understand it I didn't uh, and be honest with you I'm a soldier and I understood it happened in America I didn't didn't understand how this could happen in America and I it just I was distraught I didn't understand it and I and by God I was we were gonna help this one girl and I, I'm like, aiding with her, explaining to her. And she became a girl again. She I gave her my cell phone. She's listening to music. She's giggling. But yet she wanted to be back to these men because in her mind, they cared for her. And I couldn't understand this. Uh, and I said, don't go anything. Don't run tonight. But she told me where she was. And uh, I go, we're going to help you. We're going to get you some help. We're gonna, we're, I'm, I am going to be your mentor. I'm going to be your mentor. For the, for, I'm going to take care of you. Next day, I, I go, the next week, I'm going to take you out. Uh, I came back. She ran away the next day. Mm. And, but she told me where she was. I called up Scott's crew. We went to go get her. We got her, and we got her help. The best of the story is we got her help. We didn't lock her up. We weren't going to lock her up. We got her help. We got with her. We mentored her. A year and a half later, she's a year and a half now, later. The good part about it is she's been adopted. But it took long work lots of services she's not there yet where you think the good news story is you think she's a great gal she'll get married someday she's getting to school no it's going to be long long hard work to get to it so there's success scores and she will be successful mm -hmm. but 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 i didn't realize the effort and work it was going to take to get there and she's not there but the work that Lawanda does and the Dolores Weaver work and the work that Erica does and the work Scott does and the community does, I mean, you can't, but that's one girl. Mm -hmm. that's There's one so story. many, one story that I'm telling you that maybe some people made a difference, but the work these people are doing and, you're, and, and this show is doing, if it can make one person, it's a difference. Erica. Well, I just, I'm so excited that we were able to launch in Jacksonville the Artworks for Freedom and have this opportunity for, for every one of us to get connected because we need more people working with this girl and the other girls and identifying and looking out for them. And um, some, of the, some of the events, the artwork event that was, that, that was in Hemming Plaza this week and I think is moving to UNF, <coughs> gives you the imagery, gives you the stories, so you can, you can be on the lookout and get educated and help us because we, we need all of us. We have a tweet about that. Uh, it's, uh, if we could show it, it says, I saw the new See the Girl location next to Sunray Cinema. Uh, is Artworks for Freedom Jacks on display or rethreaded goods on sale there? Let's talk about that, uh, Lawanda. Well, uh, I'm delighted that someone um, has seen our new Girl Center, which is at Five Points. And the artworks were on display there, but they've moved. And part of the Artworks for Freedom is the exhibits are moving around the city. But they can go to artworksforfreedomsjack.org and find out where they're at now. And Rethreaded, Rethreaded has had a sale mm -hmm. in that space. They're not there now, but um, you can certainly go to Rethreaded's website as well and order from the website. And when you tweet us tonight, use that hashtag, see the girl. Explain what that means. Well, see the girl. Um, our work is about engaging communities, organizations, and individuals to promote the rights of girls and young women, and particularly those girls who are in the juvenile justice and the child protection system. And see the girl is just that. See her for who she is. And that um, statement really came from a young girl who was incarcerated and many years ago I visited her she was from Jacksonville and I asked her what would she say to individuals who had the power to change what was happening to girls and young women in the juvenile justice and the criminal justice system and this brilliant young 13 year old said I would ask the adults to see me for who I am not who you think I am mm 
And so the brilliance of see the girl is see her for who she is and all that she can become when we wrap our arms around her and really recognize what Mr. Abramowitz was talking about is that it takes all of us and it takes time to help girls to heal from the intense trauma and experiences that they've had that most of us would be crushed by. That's the thing, uh, Lieutenant, these kids go through such horrors. It's almost impossible for people to even comprehend what they've been through. Absolutely, and I'll tell you, I, I've been in the unit that I'm in that we deal with, the Integrity Special Investigations Unit. We are responsible for investigating human trafficking cases here in Jacksonville. And I've been in the unit for about a year now, and, and before that I was in law enforcement 17 years and truly had no idea how horrible the the lifestyle this is on on the victims until you get there and you and you sit down with these ladies and and even men and you hear the stories like Luanda was saying about broken bones teeth being knocked out uh, life's being threatened family members being threatened and and see that hear that tale and see that that tale mm -hmm. on the face of the victim that's when it really hits home that this this is not a choice people are making this is things that they're being forced to do against their will that if it was not so socially seen in a different light, it wouldn't be accepted at all. I mean, if, this, if, the, if a girl was kidnapped off the street and forced to do that, we would see it totally different. But that they're really, they are kidnapped. They're just kidnapped in a different sense. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. And, and let's talk, too, about the other, if we could spend a couple of minutes on the other forms of trafficking that you deal with, whether it's forced labor in the restaurant industry or even down the road uh, with the migrant workers down in Hastings. That's been a problem for decades in this area, and it's not, that hasn't gone away either. No, and it's, it's something that, um, you know, as a community, we, if we're thinking about where we're shopping, where we're buying things, the food we're, we're buying and the restaurants we're at, and we're on the lookout, we're asking the questions, who are these people that are... Um, serving us and are they safe and um, I just at the law school had a student come come to me because he had been in a, a business establishment and noticed a girl who was bruised and beaten and wanted to know what could he do because he, he spoke to her and and she said she couldn't leave and she was afraid to be there and she was from a different country and um, and the more of us that are on the lookout and and reaching out the it takes all it takes all of us because um, mm -hmm. Law enforcement, I don't think, can do it alone. Absolutely. They need our, our voices. And we still will get a few more tweets on the air before the end of the hour. If you're just joining us, it's our First Coast Forum tonight on human trafficking. If you're just tuning in, email us at firstcoastforum at wjct.org. Tweets to at wjctjax or give us a call at 358-6347. Uh, and uh, so... The Artworks for Freedom is going on this month. There's been a big public awareness push this month, uh, but I think, is it fair to say you don't want this to fall off people's radar after February is over with? Absolutely. In fact, I would hope we're having more discussions and more dialogue. Artworks for Freedom was the beginning of starting the dialogue, but there's so much more that needs to be done, and we need to continue and really raise awareness in even a more extraordinary way. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about funding, that's a tough issue. Uh, Lieutenant Dingy, in an era when uh, police officers have been laid off, uh, we are look we've closed libraries or looked at closing them, uh, it can be a hard sell to say, well, we need more funding for these types of services. And it is. These are difficult times, and they have been difficult times, but we have to prioritize what, what's more important than our children. I mean, if we can't take care of our children, then what future does any society have? So to me, it's all about prioritization, getting the money where it needs to be. Uh, certainly there are issues, you know, there's limited funds and a lot of work. Well, that's where the partnerships can come in with other agencies. That's where the community can come in. And of course, government has its piece of, of, of the pie. But if we put the, the money in the right place, that's where the good gets done. Let's talk about the partnership. It seems as though there are there is quite a bit of collaboration going on I with this. David. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, once a month as a human trafficking task force, we meet once a month. We discuss. We learn from each other. Um, as Scott mentioned, there's telephone numbers that you can, if you see anything wrong, your gut doesn't say wrong, not only the human trafficking task force, but also the hotline. 
-hmm. If you see any abuse or neglect and you don't know where you can do 1-800-96-ABUSE, you can call up and you can talk to and One of my investigators will go there. And if you see anything wrong, you, we will go there and we'll investigate it ourselves and we'll go do it. And obviously we'll talk to our brothers and sisters in arms and go do it. The key is we have such a great collaboration here in Duval County with our FBI, with our law enforcement, with the Dolores Weaver Foundation, with a whole a lot of people that I think we have a great collaboration and the awareness has gotten so much better. It's not just January and February. Sure, it may, it may temper off a little bit in gen after January and February, but the coalition keeps on talking and we should keep mm -hmm. on speaking about it. And uh, here's a call from uh, a viewer tonight. Uh, let's give this question to Erica Kern with Florida Coastal. Does the panel have the countries of origin where human trafficking is coming from? So when you talk about foreign nationals in our area, uh, I'm guessing lots of different countries, but fill us in. Yeah, we have had um, victims from Guatemala, Mexico, as far away as India, Philippines, and even um, we even had one victim who was from a European country. So they come from all over, and um, and they come for different reasons, and they come in different ways, and some of them actually enter lawfully. They're lured here, they brought under the proper visa, and then their 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 rights are taken away and they're exploited once they're here. Um, and I, you know. I think we need to look at our immigration laws and, and consider some reforms there in order to really make it safe for people. To That's a part of it, too. Well, if I could say one thing, though, uh, and this is a question that I get frequently. What, what's the nearest location where human trafficking happens? Well, it's right here. The many girls from Jacksonville are being trafficked every day. It's not from foreign countries. It, there is foreign countries, obviously, but the vast majority of the cases that we work here in, Juven in, in Duval County are at least girls from Florida if they're not exactly from Jacksonville. So mm -hmm. it's they're coming from here too. And I think people often too think, oh, that's a South Florida problem, right? right. And it is a South Florida problem. It is, problem. but not just a South but Florida it, problem. We are the third highest in the state. So when you think about Florida being the third highest in the nation and our community having the third highest number in our state, it's a major problem in North Florida. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's get everyone's final thoughts. Uh, for those that might have just been tuning in and, and, uh, and listening to this, what's the message you want to leave uh, our viewers with tonight? David. My message that I want to, I want to leave to you is we have a good partnership here in uh, Northeast Florida. And that if you see something that doesn't look like, look, doesn't look like that it's kosher, it's not right, is to report it and let the professionals take a look at it. And children are the most important thing. It's our legacy. And we can't, we got to stand by our children and make sure that even though they may not think something's, not, something's wrong, that allow us, the professionals, to take a look at it because we owe it to our children. Bobby from St. Augustine has a, an email as we get near the end of the hour. He says, what are the signs people need to be looking out for to see if someone's a victim of trafficking? Lieutenant. There's many signs. What I would suggest to anybody is go to Polaris Project on, online. There is a tremendous amount of information. They could spend hours researching human, resor uh, human trafficking and the resources available, the signs to look out for. And the, it really is an, an excellent source of information for people to learn from. Polaris Erica Curran. I would just also speak to the young people, the students, get involved now. There's a lot of work to be done and, and, um, and we need your help. And Dr. Rivora. My message would be each one of us had the power to change this. And in our choi the choices that we individually <coughs> make, but also the choice to get involved, to become educated about it, and to make a commitment that this will be a priority and that you will get involved. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you. your thoughts. We are joined by Dr. LaWanda Rivora, President and CEO of the Dolores Bar Weaver Policy Center, Lieutenant Scott Dingy with the JSO and the local coalition on this matter, David Abramowitz of DCF, and Erica Kern from Florida Coastal. Again, let's show that website. Uh, for more information, go to this website. It's polarisproject.org or call the National Human Trafficking Resource Center at 1-888-373-7888 or text to be free. And that wraps up our First Coast Forum. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. I'm Melissa Ross. And uh, as we go into the next hour, make sure to keep watching 
It's a documentary about human trafficking in Florida called Too Close to Home. That's next. Have a great night.